Well, good morning. W welcome, everyone, to the Bipartisan Policy Center. I'm Dr. Anand Parekh, uh, Chief Medical Advisor here, and I want to thank all of you for being here today. As you know, it's uh, yet another boring day here in Washington, D.C. when it comes to health care <laughs> policy. All I can say is it's probably a good thing that our event is right now and not around 2.15 this afternoon. So for those of you who are new to BPC, our mission is to actively seek to combine the best ideas from both parties to promote health, security, and opportunity for all Americans. We drive principled and politically viable solutions through the power of analysis, negotiation, and advocacy. A couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. Today's event is being streamed live online, and a recording will be available later this week. We invite you to interact with us on Twitter about today's event using the hashtag BPCLive and the handle BPC underscore bipartisan. We'll be taking a few questions after both our panel discussions today. So if you're watching online and have a question for our panelists, you can use hashtag BPC Live to ask it, and we'll try to get to those during the question and answer. Today marks the second forum in a two-part educational series here at BPC focused on patient-centered comparative effectiveness research, or in layman's terms, identifying how best to provide optimal care for patients based on science and based on patient priorities. This theme of evidence-based practice and policy is one that BPC has embraced not only within its health program here, but also more broadly as part of another effort here at BPC to advance the use of evidence-based policymaking in Congress. In April, BPC held its first forum to learn about the basics of comparative effectiveness research. What is it? What are the results showing this? Who's funding it, for example? There were a number of takeaways, such as CER matters to patients, healthcare providers, health systems, and payers. Effective dissemination of results was a major barrier to translating findings into practice. Shared decision making between provider and patient are critical to incorporating CER findings into doctor patient conversations. CER should be used to compare all types of treatment options, as well as systems level interventions. And precision medicine and CER can be paired to unlock crucial information for subpopulations. In our forum today, we look forward to building on these themes to explore the future of CER. We're excited to have two panels today, the first of which with two former leaders and members of Congress who will focus on the politics of CER and whether we can build bridges between the two parties on this issue. The second panel consisted of leaders from industry, patient groups, healthcare payers, government, and academia who will focus on challenges and opportunities for the future of comparative effectiveness uh, research, specifically as it relates to federal funding support, private sector leadership, regulatory barriers, dissemination and uptake of research results, and new areas for research. As mentioned, both panels will be followed by a short Q&A, and so we'll look forward to engaging with all of you during the event today. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Bill Hoagland, our senior vice president here at BPC. Bill will introduce our first set of distinguished guests and moderate our first panel. Bill, thank you. Thank you, Anand. Good morning, everybody, and let me extend also my welcomes to all of you to the Bipartisan Policy Center. I have the pleasure of moderating this little panel here, asking a few questions to uh, uh, Senator Kent Conrad, uh, uh, chair. I, I refer, I will refer to him as the chairman because I knew him as the chairman of the Senate Budget Committee for many years on Capitol Hill. And along with uh, uh, Senator Conrad will be uh, Dr. Phil Gingrey, Congressman Gingrey, who was a uh, from the uh, 11th Congressional District in Georgia, I believe. Uh, so let me get right into it. We have about 20 minutes here. Uh, we could take a lot more time. In fact, Senator Conrad suggested he take an hour and a half, but we won't take that long <laughs> here. Uh, I have a lead-in kind of a setting the stage question for both of them, Senator and Congressman. Uh, back in 2008, 2009, uh, early uh, 2009, uh, former Congressman Price, now Secretary Price, uh, claimed that uh, comparative effectiveness research legislation would strip doctors and patients of the right to make health care decisions, creating a permanent government rationing board. In 2009, uh, Scott Gottlieb, then former deputy commissioner of the FDA, now FDA commissioner, said that incorporating a tie between the results of research and coverage would put us on a path that more closely resembles the process used in Britain with all of its shortcomings on access, innovation, and health outcomes. Congressman Gingrey, it was reported back then uh, that you were a somewhat of a 
critic of comparative effectiveness. This is the bipartisan policy. Remember, this is bipartisan policy center here. In the Senate, however, uh, Senator Conrad, uh, during the debate on the Affordable Care Act, you as chairman of the Senate Budget Committee worked with Senator Enzi, a Republican now chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, to negotiate language that led to the creation of uh, the patient centered outcomes research, PCORI. Um, and I would note, at least from my review of all the bills that are being discussed today on repealing and replacing the Affordable Care Act, that to my knowledge, there's not a single Republican bill that touches or proposes to change or eliminate PCORI. So my basic question to both of you, what's changed over the last eight years? Is comparative effectiveness uh, research important, Congressman, Senator? Uh, and more importantly, do you think the administration, Secretary Price, Commissioner Gottlieb, uh, have the same concerns they had back in 2008, 2009? I throw it out to you. Well, um, since you mentioned Secretary Price, uh, and he was a colleague of mine in the House, I'll start. Uh, Tom Price was uh, a is also a colleague, a former colleague of mine from uh, Georgia. Georgia, and we had contiguous congressional districts. I've known uh, Tom for 30 years. We both served in the state senate uh, in Georgia, and uh, while we were not both on the Energy and Commerce Committee, we were both. I was the founding uh, uh, founder and president of the uh, House Doctors Caucus. Uh, a caucus of about 20 or so, anybody who had previous health care experience, not just MDs, but mostly MDs. And Tom and I were very active uh, in that uh, committee, and we were very much opposed to uh, PAPACA, uh, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Uh, and when this particular uh, section of the proposed legislation in H.R. 3200, I believe, was the number as we were marking up in the uh, House Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, we both shared concerns about the center then, Center for Comparative Effectiveness Research, which sounded a lot like the UK's NICE uh, board. And, and we were concerned that uh, it would be uh, cost-driven and it could possibly lead to rationing. So I will speak for Dr. Price, Secretary Price, on that matter and say that I, I think that he was definitely opposed, as I was at that point. Today? Oh, today, uh, no. I, I, that, the other part of the question, uh, and, and you know, again, we'll get into this later, but we need to look at what uh, PCORI uh, has done, what the statistics uh, have shown, and of course, as a practicing physician for over 30 years, OBGYN especially for 26, uh, you know, I, I wanted the best information that I could possibly find in regard to how to treat ovarian cancer or uh, preeclampsia on the obstetrical side, uh, uh, prostate cancer. I had a couple of uncles that were afflicted with that. And the information that has come forth uh, over these uh, uh, eight to ten years since uh, the Affordable Care Act is good information. It's information that physicians really need, some more than others. Uh, some that don't have time to keep up with the literature and, uh, or their specialty society as to what best practices guidelines are. And so I think this is invaluable information Senator, used correctly. Yeah. Senator Conrad, uh, uh, I could claim that you're the author of PCORI. When I look in here, this is the language that's in here. Wouldn't have been in here established had it not been for what you and Senator Enzi had negotiated. Now, Senator Enzi did not support the legislation, the overall, the big bill overall. Uh, how, do you, how do you bring this about? What were your thoughts on this? Well, for, first of all, I represented North Dakota, rural state, a um, lot of docs, single sole practitioners. And so many of them, and my, my grandfather is the medical chief of staff of our hometown hospital. So I grew up in sort of a medical family. My first wife was a medical doctor. I uh, went through medical school with her. Um, so I have high regard for physicians and medical science. Um, so many of the sole practitioners in North Dakota told me, look, we need more evidence-based research on what works. For example, prostate cancer that the congressman mentioned. Um, do you do surgery? Do you do radiation? 
Do you monitor? What's the best approach? And that sort of interest um, from my hometown and state constituents led me to conclude we really need, need to do more outcomes-based research. How, how can we really determine what are the things that are most effective? Uh, you know, there was a time in medical science when they thought bleeding was uh, helpful, right? I, you, you read the great stories of George Washington on his deathbed, and they say, well, we bled him at 3 o'clock, seemed to get weaker, so we bled him some more. <laughs> Poor guy. Um, and, of course, there was a time when in medical science thought uh, frontal lobotomy was a good way to treat people with mental illness. Um, so how do we really base decisions on science? And that's what led me to want to advance uh, this legislation. And you're quite right, I did negotiate this with Senator Enzi, uh, who is now chairman of the relevant committee. And he was very concerned about Congressman Murdoch here you being concerned about, that this not be turned into uh, cost-effectiveness research that would then dictate treatment options and treatment regimes. Um, and so we listened very carefully to each other and were able to come up with legislation that tried to put limits on how the information could be used uh, so that really was designed to provide the best scientific uh, information to patients, to practitioners, on what medical procedures, uh, what treatment regimes had the best effect. That was really the underlying goal. And I think um, while PCORI is imperfect, I would be the first to say that I am hopeful that PCORI becomes more targeted, um, that we do more head-to-head -head research analysis. Now, I would say there have been some wonderful things done in terms of what do we do with respect to those who suffer heart attacks, go to an emergency room, um, helping, make, uh, helping provide the information so people can make a judgment. Are they best to stay in the emergency room for further testing after initial screening, or are they okay to go home? And PCORI has done some breakthrough research there. They've done some breakthrough research on prostate uh, which of the treatment regimes is the most effective for which uh, group of patients. So that's really what we hoped the PCORI would do, and I would say um, we see some promising signs. Well, uh, let me uh, pick up there. I, I, absolutely. I, I, the language is very clear it's in the, that uh, sets the limitations you talked about to, to, in the use of it. Cannot be used in determining coverage, reimbursement, or incentive programs cannot develop or employ uh, the dollars per quality at quality, quality uh, a life year uh, development cost effect. You can't do that. Yeah. So let me ask you this, uh, doctor. Um, I asked my medical doctor advisor here too at, from time to time. So we do the research so, and you can't, government can't use this for coverage, reimbursement, incentive programs. To get that information out there, I presume, is through journals. And so a doctor does not necessarily have to follow Bacori's advice. Is that true? And, and I guess, I guess what I'm, I'm driving at here is how effective has this been in changing uh, procedures or patterns of delivery of health care to individual patients. This opportunity to thank the senator uh, for changing the language that was uh, came through the Energy and Commerce Committee markup uh, in H.R. 3200, uh, the Center for uh, Comparative uh, uh, Effectiveness Research, and to change it to PCORI. And it starts off with patient. <laughs> and that is critically important, as he knew. Uh, and, of course, working with uh, Senator Enzi. And, and that change uh, really uh, meant a lot. Uh, on the House side, um, I had an amendment that basically said that uh, the information could not be used to dictate uh, to the practitioner 
uh, in whatever specialty it might be, or, or a family doc in a, in a rural community, community of North Dakota, that they could use that information and hopefully, Bill, as you point out, that it gets disseminated to them, uh, but there may be some exceptions to the, to the findings in regard to uh, research uh, that's been done compared to effectiveness research, uh, let's say in regard to prostate cancer. And uh, if, you, if the doctor uh, followed what was recommended uh, and, and said, well, um, uh, what's recommended, it, it would be uh, that uh, we, we do uh, the surgery, robotic surgery or whatever, prostatectomy, and, but the side effect uh, uh, is uh, incontinence, as we all probably are aware uh, in this audience. Uh, and so the doctor decides not to follow that recommendation and, and, and recommends uh, radiation or, uh, depending on the patient's age, just watching because he or she, the doctor, knows that that patient uh, is a little bit, uh, tends to be a little bit de depressed on, on occasion and the, the doctor knows that patient very well and has been treating uh, him and the family for a long time and knows that he would not tolerate uh, incontinence. The same thing with uh, 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 cardiac surgery. Uh, uh, many uh, cardiologists, cardiothoracic surgeons, will tell patients, look, we can, we can solve your, your angina problem with your coronary blockage, uh, but we're not, I'm not telling you that that's going to mean you're going to live longer. You might not. We could, we could give you whatever we need to... Uh, dilate those vessels medically as long as you leave a sedentary lifestyle. Well, that may be perfect for somebody that sits around and reads and watches television and, you know, is not really sports oriented. But if somebody's an absolute fanatic on getting out on the golf course, then that, the doctor knows that and understands that. And they shouldn't, uh, uh, PCORI or the federal government or uh, uh, uncle shouldn't say, well, you got to do it our way or it's the highway in regard to reimbursement. No, and I, uh, I just say I agree with that. I, I, in studying the various health care regimes around the world, I, I read T.R. Reed's book, The Healing of America. In fact, I, I was such a fan of that book, I bought 20 or 30 copies, and I gave it, when we were going through the health care debate, I gave it to all the key players in the health care, Republican and Democrat in the Senate. Um, and he went around the world looking at the different health care systems. I must say, I, I didn't conclude from that that I became a fan of the British system. Um, and I wasn't a fan of what they did with respect to uh, comparative effectiveness research. It was too prescriptive, I thought, just for the reasons uh, the congressman has given. Um, it seemed to me it's useful to be able to provide the best research we have on what's effective, provide it to physicians, provide it to patients, let them decide. Because, you know, uh, not everybody is the same. Circumstances differ. And what you might want to do um, as a patient with somebody who is 80 years old, who's got... Um, prostate issues and somebody that's 50, that may be a very different circumstance. Uh, and the research actually shows that. So uh, I, I really think because we listened to each other, we were able to come up with something that avoided the worst fears of those who were the critics and at the same time put us on a path to provide the research, resources to really do better effectiveness research patient-centered. Uh, we just have a few more minutes here. I'm, it's not possible for a former budget committee staffer and a former chairman of a budget committee not to at least, uh, Chairman Conrad, talk a little bit about the numbers. We may get in, this may overlap a little bit with the form. I've been searching in the last 48 hours knowing about we were going to do this panel to try to come up with an estimate of the total amount that we spend in this country on comparative effectiveness research, total, both federal, state, and local uh, industry. Uh, it is impossible. Uh, you hear the number of, uh, we spend $160 billion annually on health research uh, in this country. That's with, in the private sector. 
uh, uh, or two-thirds of that in the private sector. Uh, the Institute of Medicine couldn't identify how much of that was on comparative effectiveness research. <coughs> we know the federal government spends about $35 billion on health research, most of that at NIH. But of that $35 billion or 30 or so that they spend out at NIH, uh, a very small portion of that is for comparative effectiveness research from what I can tell. We do know that PCORI is funded at about $500 million a year. Um, uh, Senator Conrad, just on the number side, uh, this is 500 million out of uh, a healthcare system costs 3.2. It just doesn't seem like the right balance. What? What? But at the same time, given the fiscal pressures, this is all appropriated money. Um, is there any hope for additional focus on comparative effective research spending in this country? Well, remember, we we do have sort of a balanced funding here um, in terms of what the federal government puts in out of general fund dollars, appropriated dollars, and then we have a levy on uh, Which goes up patients. Which goes up at the end of this month, as yeah, I understand. It's adjusted for inflation. Right. Adjusted for inflation. But, you know, that that's, you know, we talk about hundreds of millions of dollars. It seems like a lot of money. When we put it in the context of how much we're spending on health care, it kind of fades. I think the awards so far, research awards in PCORI, uh, approach $1.7 billion. Uh, just started in 2012, even though the legislation passed much earlier. It takes time to get a research um, program in place. And it takes time then to conduct the research. I, I think you're going to find, in terms of this relatively modest amount of money, I think over the next two years, you're going to see an explosion of results, because that's the nature of research, that is going to provide real answers to patients and practitioners and providers that's going to uh, dramatically improve the usefulness of this effort. Would I do more if I could do more? Sure. In the circumstance in which we have approaching, uh, well, we know the, the debt of the United States, where we are today, the deficits that we're running, where we're headed. I'd love to do more. At this point, we cannot afford to do more. I mean, that, that's the reality. So we got to do uh, with what we have. We got to do the best we can. That's why I really encourage uh, PCORI to tighten its focus. We need things that p can produce immediate or very near-term results to help people um, who want to support this effort. Uh, I see the clock clicking down here. Um, with much trepidation, I would want to ask you both about what you think was going to happen today in the Senate, but uh, <laughs> maybe, we should, maybe we should just leave it. It should be a very short answer. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, I want to thank both of you. First, but closing out here, then can you be, I guess I'm asking about the future of uh, Democrats, this is the bipartisan part, Democrats and Republicans working together in this particular area. It, 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 I take it from your comments that we're on the right track, McCory's on the right track, we're going the right direction. I would uh, agree completely with what Senator Conrad uh, answered to the previous question in regard to the amount of money and how it's spent and is it the right amount. Uh, and I don't know that we need to necessarily look toward a massive increase in, in the spending, but uh, also, uh, more, more importantly, uh, look to make sure that we're not duplicating and in, in doing the same thing in multiple areas of the federal government. Now, PCORI and ARC uh, do a great job, uh, and I'm not sitting here saying that they're overfunded, as you point out, uh, Senator and uh, Bill, about uh, a half a billion dollars uh, uh, in, in maybe growing uh, at least a piece of that at the at rate of inflation. Uh, and maybe it's not enough. But, but then if that's the case, uh, we need to look and make sure that we're not duplicating all over multiple agencies of the federal government mm -hmm. and get this uh, comparative effectiveness research focused in, in a couple of areas. I mentioned, of course, PCORI and, and ARC and to make darn sure that the information is rock-solid, good information. Uh, it's not 
the fox guarding the hen house, and then that it's, this information is disseminated to all of the physicians, as many as possible across this country, every specialty, uh, particularly the uh, primary care docs, the pediatricians, uh, the family practitioners, the general internists who may well be practicing in a rural part of Georgia or somewhere in North Dakota. Uh, with that, let, uh, Senator, unless you have any last comment, let's open it up for questions from the audience. And uh, I just want to add, I assume, uh, uh, Dr. Gamer, that independence of PCORI is critical here, too. Independence from Absolutely. Uh, in Absolutely. this day and age about uh, data and information uh, to for, maintain that independence. For sure. Okay. Julie Cantor Weinberg with Prime Therapeutics. Thanks for uh, this great panel. Question for you. I thought under current law, PCORI has to be reauthorized in 2019. 2019. Can you talk about your thoughts on the prospects for reauthorization and the funding mechanism? Prime is owned by Blues Plans, and we know they don't love the tax. Uh, so, look, um, this environment in Washington now, to me, is so toxic. Um, and I regret it very much. Uh, we've got to find a way to work together. It's absolutely imperative for the country that we find a way to work together. With that said, I think the outlook for PCORI is really quite bright uh, because of the way it was designed to avoid the pitfalls, uh, to absolutely put uh, boundaries around this research so that it is not used uh, in making treatment determinations. It is not, it is not uh, used in making reimbursement decisions. Uh, so I think, and, and the work product, at the end of the day what matters is the results. Uh, I had a chance to meet with top PCORI leadership uh, earlier this year, and what I stressed to them was results. What matters is what you produce that is tangible and there's good science and that patients and providers and practitioners can sign up to and say, hey, that was helpful to our determination on a treatment regi regime. Question back here. Thank you, a Thank you. Dr. Lisa Simpson, uh, President and CEO of Academy Health the Professional Society for Health Services Research. And first, I, I want to thank both of you for your leadership on this issue and for your statements of recognition of the importance of comparative effectiveness research as we really tackle troubling issues in improving our healthcare system. So my question to you both is sort of um, advice for the rest of <laughs> the field and the researchers and the organizations that you mentioned, PCORI and ARC, about how to do a better job of communicating the value of this kind of work to your colleagues in the House, in the Senate, um, because that's a challenge that we see that we don't do a good job of, of really explaining how important this type of research is to physicians, to patients, and I'm a pediatrician by background myself. So thank you very much. Lisa, thank you for the question. I, I think it's particularly important as we approach the reauthorization, as a uh, uh, lady just mentioned in regard to the first question, uh, in uh, 2019. Uh, it, it, the Republicans in particular uh, need convincing uh, if you're going to get uh, the program reauthorized and, and maybe plussed up a bit. There's so much pressure on a limited amount of uh, funding that everybody wants a piece of. Uh, but I think the, the best way is to have, have the stakeholders uh, the, the, the providers, the patients, the advocacy groups, uh, the payers too, uh, to, to make sure that uh, the, the congressmen uh, and women in the House and Senate understand on both sides of the aisle, uh, but particularly the Republicans who are going to be a little more skeptical, Lisa, because they were skeptical at the get-go in regard to the center for comparative effectiveness research, it was going to end up looking like the UK's nice system. But that didn't happen thanks to Senator Conrad. Uh, but they also want re to know that the results are there and that patients are getting uh, uh, quality adjusted life years uh, from this program. And it's cost effective as well. I think we have a chance for one more question here. I apologize that we have a 
good panel to follow here. We want to leave plenty of time. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Laura Cohen, um, Clinician Task Force. I work in the area of post-acute care. I'm a physical therapist by training. And I appreciate all the work that Pecori is doing and the comments about um, the comparative effectiveness research not um, impacting coverage and payment. My experience is, is otherwise uh -huh. with MedPAC and CMS uh -huh. and the CMS contractors requiring um, evidence in order to create coverage, especially in post-acute care. And so what I'd like to see and would like to know um, how PCORI and others might address it is um, new standards for research methodologies um, that will capture the complexity of people in real life. Um, the randomized clinical trials are, you know, controlled, and that's not what happens in, in real life. And you address that with the, the mission of PCORI to allow the professional to use their judgment as it affects their patient. But that's not what's happening with evidence-based policy. And how do, you, how do you see those reconciling and working together or defining new standards that will help drive evidence-based policy to truly reflect patient need? So one of the things that we hoped for with PCORI was that this model would spread. Uh, because you're really referencing other elements of policy making where the same rules don't apply. Let me just say this to you. You know, if you look at what's happening, uh, the PCORI model is spreading. The, the notion of patient-centered research and analysis, patient-centered, is really spreading. And I don't have the time to go through all the examples, but uh, you can really see how this is catching on and that's something we hope for. Yes, and I'll just add to that and say that uh, we, our firm, the district policy group, let me give a shout out to, to them. I've been with the firm now for about three years, and we have a number of, of uh, entities that you mentioned, that, uh, advocacy <laughs> groups for different uh, disease entities, and, uh, and they are, they're, they're very concerned that that the treatment is appropriate to the patient, individualized medicine, and that the, their doctors that they're seeing for whatever terrible malady that might have befallen them, uh, that if the doctor makes a decision to go outside what is deemed by the, the comparative effectiveness of research to be uh, the best choice, that they don't have to jump through so many hoops uh, that by the time they get an answer, uh, the patient is either uh, well or not so well and, and too late to do anything about. So I think it is, it is very important. Uh, and again, I, I'm confident that that will continue uh, uh, thanks to the final language uh, uh, in the bill. Uh, and and that's, that's why you're not hearing too much concern right now about that particular entity. Things like IPAB, of course, that's different. The Independent Patient uh, Payment Advisory Board, is that really needed at this point? So that's something, that's a whole other story. We'll have you, we'll uh, have you back but, for the discussion yeah, about we'll that Yeah, we'll have later. that discussion <laughs> at another time. I want to thank uh, uh, Senator Chairman Conrad, uh, Representative Gangry. Uh, thank you for your service. Thank you to your service to the country. And thank you, most importantly, to your service on this particular issue, which I think is so critical. So with that, let's uh, give them a round of applause. <laughs>